Bienvenidos, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Welcome to the Learn Spanish con Salsa Podcast. Here's your host, Certified Language Coach, Tamara Marie. Hola, bienvenidos al otro episodio del podcast Learn Spanish con Salsa. Welcome to another episode of the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast. I am your host, Tamara Marie. And on this episode of the podcast, I am super excited to bring a conversation with one of the members of our Spanish con Salsa community, uh, who's going to share her experience uh, learning Spanish over several decades. Um, she's going to talk about everything that she tried from going to school for Spanish to doing immersion trips and how after all of that, she still struggled with her confidence in speaking the language. And I think that this is a really important conversation to listen to if you are someone who has been learning Spanish, maybe off and on, maybe you've been, you know, having times where you're making progress, but then you find yourself stuck or demotivated for some reason you know that time when you tried to jump into a spanish conversation and you didn't understand what was going on and you just kind of gave up because you were kind of like eh, maybe i'm not good at languages or maybe this isn't for me or maybe this is just too hard or i'm doing something wrong so if you've ever struggled with that in your journey to fluency which you are definitely still on because if you're listening to this podcast i know that you have a burning desire to speak spanish fluently and it's something that is important to you And today's conversation, I think, will really show you that perseverance is going to be your best friend if you want to get fluent in Spanish, but also finding an approach that will work for you. Uh, so Cynthia is going to share with you her journey to Spanish fluency. And I promise you, uh, you have not had as many obstacles as she's had and as many uh, things that have probably come into your way in the time that you've been learning that could have really caused you to quit. Uh, and something that I think is really key in our conversation is finding out what works for you, but also knowing um, when to switch gears and try something different and also when to not give up. So if you've ever felt like, you know, maybe I'll just be okay with Spanish, but I'm never going to really speak it well, or um, I'm just learning right now. I'm not ready to speak. I hope that you will listen to Cynthia's story because it, it will definitely um, get you to think a little bit differently about your approach. So uh, without uh, any further delay, here is my conversation with Cynthia Abejuro. Hi, Cynthia. Welcome to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate you taking the time to join me to share your story, because I know you have been one of our star members of our Spanish Fluency Club, which is our membership community where uh, we are learning Spanish, but more in a group setting and mm -hmm. also getting coaching and support through that process. So could you first uh, talk a little bit about what sparked your interest in learning Spanish in the first place? And what is it that made you want to become fluent in Spanish? Oh, I have a very personal reason for doing that. Um, the, my mother's family is from Cuba. My mother was adopted as a child into a family that wasn't Spanish speaking. And, but interestingly enough, she maintained contact with her biological family. So um, my abuela would um, be calling on the phone and she would of course have me count and tell her the colors in Spanish. But that was about the extent of the Spanish learning experience that I got. But I've always been someone that really was fascinated by other languages and other cultures. And I had a burning desire since I was really a very young child to be fluent, especially after seeing my cousins speak Spanish so easily. So that was my spark. Okay. And what was it that made you go from just this desire of like, you know, it would really be nice if I could communicate more um, in Spanish to actually starting that process of learning the language? Uh, well, I think it's my personality. Um, I've been, no, been called at work the bulldog. And <laughs> once I start on something, I don't let it go. <laughs> and that's been since I was a, a little girl. My mother said that tenacity was my best personal uh, quality. And uh, once I've decided to do something, as my mother said, don't get in her way, she'll walk right over you. So this has been, uh, this has been a lifelong um, struggle, love, and also journey, I should say. So tell me about your first attempt. So what, like, what was the first thing you tried and about, I guess, how old were you or how long ago was it where you made your first attempt at learning Spanish and how did that go? Well, my first attempt at learning Spanish was um, in a university. So I took one year, I was on scholarship and that 
could take whatever classes I wanted to basically outside of my major. And so um, I had some free time and I needed extra credits. So I thought, oh, this is going to be a perfect time to take, you know, a year of Spanish, which I did. And I mean, I got a very good foundation for grammat for the gra grammatical understanding of the language. But, you know, this is way, way, and I don't even want to tell you how many years ago it is, because probably before you were born. <laughs> but this is barely before the internet and all the other resources that we have now. And it was really, really difficult to learn a language um, unless you basically went to a, a Spanish-speaking country or a country that was speaking that your target language. So the first thing was, the first step was one year in the university. Yeah, and I think what you what you mentioned there, I you know, honestly, I don't think things changed a whole lot. I mean, I think now maybe they're a little bit better from what I've been seeing. But mm -hmm. um, even when I was in school, I started in high school, you know, and you have to pick a language and I pick Spanish. But um, I think what you said still rings true. Like, yeah, it gives you a good understanding of grammar, <laughs> which mm -hmm. um, which is the same thing. If we think about it, what, you know, as a native English speaker, we learn English grammar in school because mm -hmm. coming into an English class, you're already speaking English at home. So it's not like they're teaching you English or just teaching you how to format it properly in an academic setting. Right. Um, but the, I find the approach to foreign language to be similar, which is problematic because oftentimes mm -hmm. the thing that we want to do is, is speak the language and communicate mm -hmm. with people. And what we mm -hmm. get is here's how you conjugate a verb that ends in AR, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and that usually leaves us unable to, to have conversation. So, um, and I think a lot of people get discouraged that way as well, mm -hmm. because you feel like you're failing at something, even if you're getting like good grades in school, then the minute you go out and try to have a conversation, you're like, okay, this isn't working. I don't understand what they're saying. Right. So you, you said you took Spanish in university. So I guess that was about a year or so, or did you continue taking it beyond no, that? Like first, year? I took that in my senior year and then it was like, okay. um, you know, um, again, this is way before all of the technology and also the different mindset that young people have now that if they just want to do something, they're going to go and do it and not worry about the cost of it. Um, that number one wasn't the way I was raised and number two, that was a different time. So it really took me like, you know, about 10 years after that before I could save up enough money working to go to Mexico and study in a language school. So I did actually had two different trips to Mexico to do that. And still, even after that experience, my family, were, my cousins were falling off the seat laughing at me every time I said anything. Oh, no. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about that. So you, so you learned in school, so you had a bit of a foundation of grammar. So you had some mm -hmm. basically familiarity with the language and then, you know, it took you a little while and then you went to Mexico. So talk a little bit about those trips. Like, was it an immersion uh, trip? Did you go to a language mm -hmm. school? Tell me like a yes, little bit about your experience yes. there and yes you know, how you felt about your Spanish uh, coming through that experience and, and did you make improvements or, or how did you feel mm -hmm. about it? Yes, uh, the first one was the Instituto Cultural in Oaxaca. And um, I booked the trip and didn't even know where Oaxaca was. I thought it was outside of Mexico City. Then I looked at the map after I bought the plane ticket and was kind of shocked. But I, that was, yeah, <laughs> that was an amazing experience because I had family stays for both of those immersion experiences. And I think in Oaxaca, that really was where I was the most comfortable coming back here and most confident, um, even though my family still, because they were still falling off this chair laughing at me every time I said anything. <laughs> so um, um, that was in Oaxaca. And then a couple of years later, I went to uh, the Bilingual Bicultural Institute in Cuernavaca, which really was one of the best um, educational experiences that I've ever had. And um, at that time, it really, ex I was really very much surprised that my Spanish was to a level where of course the classes are taught uh, that at, at that time, well, at my level, I should say, um, only in Spanish. And I was able to actually take notes in Spanish during the class. And this is like anthropology or le legends or you know history of Mexico. So, um, you know, both experiences were just really invaluable and also invaluable in increasing my confidence in speaking. All right, okay. So a year in college, two immersion trips to Mexico, starting to gain some confidence, having familiarity. Mm -hmm. And yet you go to speak to your family who's primarily from Cuba. And you said they're, they're kind of, you know, laughing at you and, and no, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't kind of laughing. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about that. Cause that must be frustrating. Cause I know for me, right. So in school primarily as well, I think we learn Spanish 
you know, either from like Mexico or from Spain, right? Those are like the mm -hmm. two, at least in the US mm -hmm. that they focus on. Mm -hmm. And we might learn, oh, there's a difference between, you know, Spanish and Spain, they use vosotros and, you know, that's the only difference. And then like everything, like we're just taught, oh, there's these two words that are different. And then, um, you know, but, but yeah, you could just speak the language and Spanish is Spanish everywhere. But I also quickly learned when I started traveling that there are some very stark differences in the language that uh, for someone learning the language is really difficult. For someone who's a, even a native speaker, it can be a little bit, um, you know, take some time to navigate. But mm -hmm. as, a, as someone who's learning the language, mm -hmm. uh, picking up on those nuances is almost impossible in the beginning, mm -hmm. especially if you don't know. So talk about how you felt you know, going back to speak to your family, you had this confidence and, and then you're talking to your cousins and they're like, that's not <laughs> They serious. cut me off at the knees. Yeah, okay. They cut me off at the knees. <laughs> it was awful. And I mean, it still, it made, it, it really diminished my confidence in speaking yeah. because I didn't know what the problem was. And I think that really, um, if this is a kind of a failing in, in many Hispanic families, is that they don't realize how hard it is to learn and how much time and how much money you spend trying to learn. And, you know, if my family had been more supportive, it would have been a lot easier for me. But they just, you know, laughed, basically. And, um, you know, your family can be really cruel anyway, but um, yeah. this was, it was very hurtful and it really diminished my, you know, I had all this confidence coming back from Mexico and this just really I evaporated it. It just evaporated. Wow. You know, I really appreciate you mentioning that perspective because I think for so many people, there is this fear that they're going to be laughed at. Like that's the fear that everyone has on why they don't mm -hmm. speak Spanish. And the fact mm -hmm. that you went through the point of getting that um, that confidence and, and really taking time, like you said, investing your time and your, your money, right, mm -hmm. into really, you know, attempting to learn the language for the purpose of connecting with your family. Mm -hmm. And then to have that reaction I can mm -hmm. only imagine how how demoralizing that could be. But mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting because, like you mentioned, it's it there's something that happens with families that immigrate to other countries in general. Um, but I think, you know, in the U.S., I have noticed that there is this tendency where you have some families that want their children to only speak English, mm -hmm. you know, because they view it as not really necessarily assimilation, but more of, listen, I want you to be able to speak this language. I, I came here for a better life. I don't need you learning Spanish. I need you to be the one in the family that, you know, is successful. So I'm, I'm making the sacrifice for you. So your English needs to be impeccable and I don't need you speaking Spanish and sometimes don't value, you know, passing on that part of the culture because the reason that you go through all of this um, up, up, up into your entire life is so that your children can have a better future. So sometimes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I think you're right that some some families that are, um, you know, that that come here with their children mm -hmm. do not emphasize, you know, passing on the language and, and the culture in that way and don't maybe realize how difficult that could be um, for the for the children. And I think also you bring up this point. And I'm glad you said it because we often say like, you know, I'm always trying to tell people, no, no one's going to laugh at you. Trust me, it's going to be fine, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I think is true for those of us who aren't, um, who don't have family members, right, that are, you know, because people, when they see you from the outside and you're trying, you know, they give you a lot more leeway mm -hmm. than uh, someone whose family, like you said, sometimes, unfortunately, people who are closest to us can be the, the cruelest, right? The people that hurt you the most are the people that are closest mm -hmm. to you. So mm -hmm. I think that there is a different um, a different dynamic there. So I'm so glad you brought that up because, because yeah, I mean, you know, for someone that's an outsider, quote unquote, um, the, I think the worst that I've experienced is someone will just start speaking to me in English. And then I would take offense to that, like, oh, my Spanish mm -hmm. must be horrible um, mm -hmm. because, you know, they 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 clearly are like, okay gringo like let me just let me help you out <laughs> like, and um, if they were bilingual they were just kind of switched to English so I used to take offense to that when I went to Puerto Rico it happened to me quite a bit but yeah I mean the fact that family one didn't prepare you and two you know basically mocked you at your attempts mm -hmm. to learn um, mm -hmm. I guess you know like you said you really are persistent because here you are mm -hmm. still <laughs> so yes, what, many years me, later <laughs> Yeah. So I'm tell sorry. me, so tell me then what, so take me back to that point. So you, you had spent this time in Mexico, you, you come back, you're talking to your family, they're laughing at you. And what, was it because your, your Spanish was more like Mexican because that's where you learned? Was it because it was just 
what what was the, what was the reason for it or do you even know and then what did you do after well there's several different times that they've laughed over the years let's put it that way um oh, gosh. yes oh yeah it's they can be cruel they can be rough they can be brutal um i came back and um you know obviously that wasn't and as i said i'm my tenacity is my biggest you know quality so i connected with the university um here uh my local university and asked if they had a Spanish-speaking student that wanted to do a language exchange. So I did that. And um, at the time, interestingly enough, um, I have a 30-year performance career in flamenco. And so a lot of the, the, the instructors who came from Spain obviously did not teach class in English. They taught in Spanish. So I understood enough that I was able to, you know, to do well in the classes and not have any problems to ask questions if I needed to. So, but I didn't really speak a lot of Spanish with the other dancers because they, everybody used English because there were many um, people there that did not speak Spanish. So um, I did that and the language exchange. And then through the language exchange, I met some other people who I became friends with and they were Mexican. And so I really interacted with them a lot. And um, at that time, I was way before I got married, um, I started going out with from that group, one of the members, one of the friends' um, brothers, and I think it was, and they were from Mexico, from Durango. And so his parents did not speak English. So I had to speak Spanish when I was with them. And again, my family's laughing because they asked me something, they say, Mande? And they're like, oh my God, you're South Mexican. <laughs> but you persevered, right, through, mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. And so what was it do you think made uh made the biggest difference for you where you started to feel more comfortable was it that you were in environments with people where you were not necessarily forced to speak spanish but it just became easier to have more social interactions in spanish um well i think that's a very interesting question um i really lost my confidence uh probably about five years ago a little bit more than five years ago in speaking and i had even studied at a very well-known language school that's close to my home um, they were very, very well known. And the instructor that I had was from Argentina. And uh, it was a one-on-one. -on -one. And I mean, I actually took inheritance money that I had to do the course. It was so expensive. And all she did was she told me how bad my Spanish was, how many mistakes I made. And it was very difficult to teach me because I made so many mistakes. And my response was, if I didn't make mistakes, I wouldn't need to be in the classroom with you. I mean, really. All right. So um, I terminated that experience. And as, it, you know, as I said, I keep, I kept looking for other um, venues to improve my Spanish and also improve my confidence. And I'm really not sure how I found Spanish con salsa, but this, and at time, I really want to thank you for this because number one, there on the, on the platform, there are a multitude of classes and information. And it's, I mean, it's so much, and sometimes I think, oh my God, what am I going to do next? But um, everything is broken down so well and having the being a part of the conversation club and also having the um, accountability partner really helped me amazingly. And since I was in the advanced um, conversation group, the goal was to do a 15 minute presentation in, um, in Spanish at the end of the course. And I had had the language coaching with Hayel and Hayel actually uh, it suggested the conversation club to me. She said, well, you know, that you can have the 15 minute um, presentation at the end of the class. And I was like, but that will really push me, you know, uh, make me even go further than I think I can go. And um, I think really Spanish con salsa has really helped me even with coworkers that I have who are Spanish speaking. Now I have two, one's from Chile and the other one's from Puerto Rico. And I don't, I noticed this about myself just this last week. I didn't have any problem asking how to say something, you know, how do you say this? And then, yes, I have, I, I work in the uh, clinic and I have many patients who are Spanish speaking. And um, many times we, we use the phone interpreter for, um, for any language. And usually I will, and I've gotten better, I'll introduce myself in Spanish and say, I'm going to use the phone interpreter just because I don't want to make a mistake, but I will be here listening. And many times I've caught the interpreter not interpreting correctly. Wow. Hey, it's Tamara Marie. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. Really quickly, I just wanted to let you know about an opportunity for you to dramatically improve your Spanish coming up very, very soon. 
I know when I first started learning Spanish, it was really difficult for me to make consistent progress. I downloaded every resource I could find. I even took classes at a community college, but I found that I still was afraid and unable to carry on a conversation with a native speaker. That's why we started the Spanish Fluency Club. We provide community support, coaching, and regular conversation practice with a detailed plan and the feedback that you need to improve. You will gain the momentum and have the opportunity of speaking Spanish every week so that you're getting better and better and you have those opportunities to continuously move forward. So if you're feeling stuck in your Spanish journey, if you don't have anyone to talk to in Spanish consistently, that will correct you kindly and give you the feedback that you need to improve your accent, to improve your pronunciation, to improve your vocabulary so that you sound more like a native speaker. I invite you to check out the Spanish Fluency Club. We will be opening doors very, very soon. And the only way to make sure that you are on the list to get notified when we open the doors, you have to be on our wait list. So please go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash join. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash join to sign up for the wait list for the Spanish Fluency Club. We will hook you up with a coach, with a community who is supportive so that you will never be lost and you know exactly what you need to do to improve your Spanish so that you finally get to fluency. So if you're interested in checking out the Spanish Fluency Club and all that we have to offer, go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash join. Okay, now back to the episode. Something you just said is really key that, you know, and this is also a part of having confidence in the language. So you mentioned having, um, you know, a coworker from Chile and then one from Puerto Rico. So mm-hmm. two very different uh, types of, of Spanish to the mm-hmm. point where there are words that are very, very different, right? In both countries, the accents can be different. Mm-hmm. And just, just having that awareness and being able to ask that, oh, how do you, you know, how do you say this or what is this word? Because just because you don't know a word doesn't mean that your Spanish is insufficient in some way. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always try to mm-hmm. tell people. It's like, you have to have that skill of how do you navigate when you don't understand something because mm-hmm. it is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I think especially for people who are educated and used to being smart in other areas that it can be very humbling when you're in mm-hmm. a situation where you have to ask or where you don't know. And a lot of people I think have the tendency to try to play it off and pretend you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but they really don't. And that can lead to so many misunderstandings, mm-hmm. right? Um, especially mm-hmm. in, a, in, you know, work environment, especially with coworkers, you don't want to have some lingering thing where you just like are nodding like, yeah, see, 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 yo, okay, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like you understood. And then they said something completely different and you didn't catch it. So I think mm-hmm. it's so important for communication to be able to know when it's appropriate to just ask, you know, for clarification, because mm-hmm it's so easy to, to sort of mix things up. And I think that a lot of us see it as, you know, especially when you're learning the language, you want to be proficient. And it's almost like we want to do this performance of like, oh, I speak this perfect Spanish and I understood. But that's not the point. The point is to communicate with another human being. And even in whatever language, if there's a miscommunication, there's a problem. So I love that you said just like, not being afraid to do that and not and realizing, having the confidence to realize that that doesn't mean that, you know, there's a ding against your Spanish skills. It's just like, oh, I need to ask this question so that we can have effective communication. So I think that's very important. Um, one thing I did want to ask you, though, is is so when you, you were kind of going through all these different experiences, you spent clearly a lot of time, effort and resources into your Spanish. And you, you mentioned kind of during lockdown, looking for resources online. Um, but when you when you started with Spanish Con Salsa, where were you with with your level of confidence and with speaking because you mentioned like maybe about five years ago you had kind of lost that confidence so at the point when you when you joined like where were you with that confidence and and how has that shifted since you've been um, a member um i think my confidence still wasn't really great you know another thing i want to say about spanish consulta which is a one of one of the many many things that i think is amazing about this this platform is that i got from one of your um class for members only about what to do when you don't understand is that, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously I'm, I'm a perfectionist. That is my, my goal. You know, I want to be perfect Mm -hmm. and everything, but you said something and it really, really stuck with me. There's never going to be a time that you're going to understand everything. That was kind of a aha moment for me. And, um, that plus the fact that with the coaching classes, you have a plan. You actually have a plan with attainable goals. Why is this important to me? Because number one, I need a goal. And number two, I work as a trainer. 
I'm a preceptor in the, in the clinic. And I have very small goals for the people that I train. I've been training for seven years and we scaffold everything onto what we've learned before because we do procedures in my department. So I build their confidence with very small things. But just that idea of having the goal and then with the uh, language coaching sessions initially that to, re to receive the um, recordings of the coaching session. And you know what? I, I'll tell you, Tamara, after my first session with Hayal, I looked at I, I listened to my recording and I was like, gosh, my Spanish really isn't too bad. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, all of these things are just, there's a mountain of resources on the Spanish called Salsa that I really didn't even understand until Kyle kept saying, well, why don't you look here? Why don't you look there? It's like, is that there really? And um, <laughs> for the price that you pay, it's it's an, an, immen an immense offering of information and resource. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned just that you you actually watched the recording mm -hmm. and were able to to see and and actually just look at like oh actually it's, i did pretty pretty good and mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. I, as a recovering perfectionist myself <laughs> <laughs> i definitely understand right because in the moment when you're when you're stuck like when you're in that conversation and you're like i can't think of the word or did i say mm -hmm. that right you're questioning yourself mm -hmm. and it feels mm -hmm. very much like you're stumbling through mm -hmm. but when you actually go and look back at it, reflect and you go, wait, she understood me. I understood that mm -hmm. the conversation mm -hmm. is actually flowing and maybe only once or twice that I get tripped up. But when you're in it, it feels like an infinity of time that you're fumbling through. Right. And for someone, like I said, that's used to sort of, you know, being mm -hmm. able to navigate things just because of like your tenacity and, and just, mm -hmm. you know, your aptitude for things and just being on top of things in general in life that can be a very, very unsettling and uncomfortable experience. So I, I'm so glad that you actually did that because as many times as I, I'll tell people over and over again, here's the recording, watch the recording, take mm -hmm. notes, look at what happened, review mm -hmm. so that you can hear again because repetition is so important. Take mm -hmm. notes on the words that you that were new for you that came up, that which did you learn, practice the things you didn't do correctly because that part of it is so valuable, but so many people don't do it. They'll just show up mm -hmm. to a session and then they'll go, oh, I didn't have time to do anything this week. And then, you know, they, they're not getting the full benefit because they're not doing it. So I'm just so glad that you're listening and doing those things and seeing the benefit because as much as, you know, we and, and the coaches on the team try to tell everyone that until you actually do it, it's really, really hard to see. So I'm hoping even some of our current members will listen to this and say, oh, all right, maybe I'll actually go back and do it now <laughs> uh, because I can see that, you know, it, that actually is a very important part to learning is that that review and also um, being able to look at yourself a little bit more objectively uh, and, and go, you know what, I'm, I'm doing OK. Or hmm, I notice I keep making this mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, you found that benefit and that has helped you continue to build your confidence. So. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say? I mean, you mentioned there's a lot of resources at Spanish Consults, and we do really try to make sure, you know, that we have everything that you need so it's a one-stop shop. Because I know, especially mm -hmm. now, we've got, like, AI, and there's ChatGPT, mm -hmm. and there's, mm -hmm. you know, all these YouTube videos. There's, like, so many resources that mm -hmm. I think now the issue is that people just get drowned in the sheer yes. amount of stuff you could do. Mm -hmm. And being able to direct and focus and make progress is actually harder mm -hmm. in this environment. So what well, what would you say is the biggest benefit that you've had from this process of just being, you know, going through the language coaching process and also mm -hmm. your participation in the fluency club. What, what do you say is, what would you say is the biggest difference and about how long did it take you to really kind of see a, an improvement? Well, um, I, I think that the goal setting is crucial. Um, and, um, it's also crucial to have the accountability partner. I was on italki for four years and i had really good instructors there but their classes were their classes and when i asked to do something different they really didn't want to vary from their classes because i know that would need more work for them and um that just wasn't available on on that platform but to be able to have someone my goal one of my goals is very simple um to order comfortably in the restaurant and to say, you know, give me a change for this bill, give me a change for that bill, and keep the change. As long as you're mm -hmm. able to accomplish your goals and, you know, continue to make progress and mm -hmm. communicate with people effectively, you're winning. You know, mm -hmm. it's not about, you know, becoming this perfect, you know, dictionary for Spanish and English and never making a mistake. It's about what is my goal? What do I want to do? And, you know, can I make steps towards that? So, 
Um, I guess the last question I want to ask you before I ask you a few questions in Spanish mm -hmm. is, you know, going through all this and, and coming through the process with Spanish con salsa and um, what, how is your relationship now with your family in terms of your Spanish? Have you, have you given up on them or are you still, well, are you still uh, shy? <laughs> I've kind of given up at this point, but something that's uh, really in, in important because this is Spanish con salsa and they do um, focus on Caribbean Spanish. Um, the boot camp this summer was Cuban Spanish. And even though I wasn't able to attend the classes, I was able to, you know, access the course. And I will tell you that I finally understood something that my aunt was saying when I was 17 years old, which is a whole lot of years ago because of that. Uh, I mean, it was just like, I, did, I just couldn't understand what the heck is she talking about? You know, because what I understood in Spanish was like, not what she was saying, definitely. And it was like, I finally understood after decades long, you know, some yeah. things that I had heard in my family. I have a pretty good memory. And um, it's like, oh my God, that's what they were saying. And I, I didn't, it took me all this time to, you know, realize it. Because um, if you have a traditional learning path in Spanish in a university or a high school, um, they don't teach you, as you said in the beginning, Spanish that you can use on the street. But you have that, you know, that 21 day course of, of, of uh, fluency of or phrases that are more real world. And then also in the conversation club, the dialogues with Spanish that you can, that can, you can actually use that makes you sound more like a native speaker. So you, so that, you know, if you're an, not in your family that who speaks Spanish, that they don't switch to English when you're talking, or if you're like me in a, in a Spanish speaking family where they're laugh, falling off the chairs laughing because you, you sound, you, you sound like a textbook. You sound like a textbook. Mm. You need to come down to the, yes. the the real people. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad that that that's been helpful to you. Because yes, that's definitely a push. Is that learning just for the sake of learning is great, but we don't necessarily focus on you know passing like a test or something like that. In Spanish con salsa, the idea is that you learn the culture, you learn the language, you learn the people, and the way people actually speak. Whether or not you know it's textbook correct or it's the Queen's Spanish or whatever it is mm -hmm. that. For us, it's important that you can communicate with people and understand people. And a, a lot of things get lost in translation. Like you said, this idea of like spending all this time and resources and sounding like a textbook yes. is, you know, it's it's so unhelpful, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, if, if your goal is to pass a test, fine, go for it. Right. You'll mm -hmm. you'll you get flying colors. You'll be anointed with level, you know, C1 advanced Spanish <laughs> and you still can't have a conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, right. But yeah, because that was sort of my experience too. Like I was like, oh, I'm acing these like online quizzes and then I still mm -hmm. can't talk to someone. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you you found that uh, useful because that is something that's really important to us is making mm -hmm. sure that you can actually use what you're learning in some way and, and immediately, right? Not mm -hmm. like, oh, it's going to take you six months before you can now go. It's like, no, all right, what do we learn in this lesson, this mm -hmm. conversation and what can you use in your next conversation? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that is very, very important because that's also the way that you get better. You know, I say mm -hmm. you get fluent sort of like one word, one phrase, one conversation at a time, one context mm -hmm. at a time, one su mm -hmm. subject matter at a time, because um, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure your profession, there's things I don't even understand in English, let alone Spanish. Right. So right. we all kind of have to master what's important to us in the context that we live in and not the sort mm -hmm. of fictional, you know, textbook person who's always, you know, the, the the guy going to a Spanish speaking country at a bar and asking the girl to buy her a cerveza. Like that is not <laughs> most of our experience, but that's where all the courses start, right? It's uh, like, right, you're, right. A, you're at a business trip and you want to get Maria a cerveza. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> so, so Cynthia, I'm, I'm so glad. I wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time mm -hmm. to join me on the podcast and for sharing your story. And I know this will help mm -hmm. um, so many people who are you know, maybe struggling as well to, to learn Spanish. I hope your tenacity rubs off on anyone who's listening to this, that regardless of where you are, that you just don't give up. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll get to that point where, you know, you can be comfortable speaking the language and it'll seem like, oh, was I ever a person that couldn't speak Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And before we wrap up, do you mind if I ask you a few questions in Espanol? Oh, no. Okay. Bye. <laughs> okay. Entonces, uh, Cynthia, uh, ¿cuál es tu palabra o frase favorita en español? <laughs> no creo que tengo una, una favorita. Um, a, mí me gusta a mí me gusta mucho la palabra um, corazón o, o tierno. 
porque siempre los, lo digo a mi esposo, a, a mi esposo a tierno, es muy simpático, pero no tengo una favorita frase, ni un dicho. Ni un dicho. ¿Tienes una canción favorita en, en español? Claro que sí. Uh, uh, para mí es uh, La vida es carnaval, hecho por Sila Cruz. Ah, sí. Y también, sí, sí, sí. Y también mis, uh, mi música la flamenca. Me, a mí me encantan las sirianas, las voice fighters. Uh, flamenca es algo nuevo para mí. Normalmente no escucho mucho flamenco, pero creo que un poquito de tango, porque yo fui a Argentina, uh -huh. pero... Uh -huh. Con, con flamenco no. Yo fui a España una vez y, y traté de ir a un, una clase de flamenco, pero estaba en otro día y tuve que pasar por otra parte del país, entonces no existí, pero interesante, interesante el flamenco. Interesante, para, sí. para mí es muy, es muy bonito, pero yo prefiero la bachata y la salsa, la verdad. <risa> es, es muy, muy difícil, es muy, muy difícil. Entonces, necesito clases de ti, de flamenco. <risa> la última pregunta. Si no tuvieras que trabajar, ¿qué harías con el tiempo adicional? Bueno, uh, pues si no tuviera que trabajar, um, aprendería más idiomas, no solamente español, sino francés. Y también mi esposo es, es filipino y me gustaría aprender muchos más palabras y frases en, en su idioma, Tagalog. Es, es, hay palabras españolas y en Tagalog, pero es un, un idioma muy, muy diferente y muy difícil. Más idiomas. Sí, sí. Sí, yo, yo también. Mi, mi hijo está aprendiendo japonés. Wow. Y para mí es, es, es tan difícil porque tienen tres alfabetos diferentes. Distintos, mm. ¿no? Yo quiero también aprender un poquito de japonés y uh -huh. solamente por él. Y también árabe. Árabe es un idioma uh -huh. que yo quiero aprender árabe egipto porque yo quiero ir allí. Pero en este momento uh -huh. es como cada vez que quiero ir a esta parte del mundo hay, hay alguna uh -huh. guerra o algo así. Entonces es como mm, sí, es yo verdad. no sé, yo no puedo ir ahora, pero en el futuro yo no sé. <ríe> pero sí, um, entonces Uh, muchísimas gracias, Cynthia. Thank you so much for joining on the podcast. Okay. And um, just before you go, is there anything that you would say to someone who might be struggling with learning Spanish right now or is maybe thinking about maybe joining Spanish con salsa? What, what would you say to them? Um, Spanish con salsa will give you a coach and a map. And that's important because I spent many years without having a coach and a map. Had good instructors, but no real map to reach my goal and to make your goal something Small in the beginning, as, as Tom always says, make it, um, I want to order in the restaurant. The, it's invaluable having a coach that can help you plan out the goal and also how to reach it. As long as you don't give up, you haven't, you haven't failed, you know, right. and I think you are such a great example of that. And I am so glad to see how you continue to improve. And I would lo love to see you doing more with Cuban Spanish and, you know, having, I, I just want to see your family members one day look at you and go, whoa, is that, is that, <laughs> like, is we, is she knows more than we do. <laughs> I just like, kind of want that for you. Like, I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to see you do more with that. I will continue to do more of Cuban Spanish in the future as okay, well. So, uh, but yes, but thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the podcast. Que tengas un buen día. Gracias. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Cynthia. And I'm really grateful to her for sharing her experience because uh, I couldn't imagine um, just going through all of the trouble that she went through, all of the time and resources that she put into wanting to connect with her family only to find that they were not super receptive uh, to her. And I know that, you know, a lot of times, like I said in a conversation with her, that, you know, our fear that we're going to be laughed at, that really is our biggest fear. And the fact that that happened to her um, shows that even if you think that that is going to be the response to people when you start speaking Spanish, that you can overcome it. And part of overcoming it is finding a supportive community and people that you can speak Spanish with that will not laugh at you. I can't even imagine uh, going through that. But like she said, you know, family is family and everyone, I'm sure you have your own stories about your family members, some of them who may not be your favorites. Um, and unfortunately for Cynthia, those were her family members that spoke Spanish. Uh, but for you, you know, 
you probably won't have that experience. And if you connect with a community uh, like Spanish Con Salsa, where we have native speakers who are from different countries, especially uh, Spanish speakers from the Caribbean, which um, are some of the most popular uh, destinations. They're, they're some of the places where a lot of people are from that may move to different um, countries. And so uh, it's going to be very valuable to get that experience of having conversations with people from Puerto Rico, from Dominican Republic, from Cuba, uh, from Central America, and not just from Spain or Mexico. So if you're looking for a supportive community that will give you real feedback to see how you're doing uh, in speaking Spanish and also help you gain that confidence that you need to be able to learn the language and be able to speak it fluently, then I encourage you to consider joining the Spanish Juan Salsa community uh, very shortly here. If you're listening to this podcast in August or September 2024, uh, we will be opening the doors to our Spanish Fluency Club. We will have a new round of group cohorts that will be starting very, very shortly. Uh, so you can go to SpanishJuanSalsa.com slash join if you would like to be a part of our membership. So I definitely encourage you that if this is something that you have thought about in the past, but you just haven't uh, taken the leap, right? And you haven't really just decided to see what it's all about, uh, then I definitely encourage you to check us out. Um, if you're listening to this after August or September 2024, no worries. You can still go to our website, uh, SpanishConSalsa.com slash join, and you will be able to join our wait list. So uh, we will be opening up doors, like I said, very shortly here. Uh, so make sure you sign up for our waiting list, SpanishConSalsa.com slash join. And just check it out. See what it's all about. See if this might be the thing that you need to get your Spanish to the next level. So as always, I hope that something you heard on today's podcast has taken you one step closer from Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com.